So we're continuing to think tonight about uh, what it means to be salt and light people, bearing in mind Jesus' expectation and command that we, as his people, will make a difference in this world. And we were reminded last week that it's not so much particular methods as particular people that God uses. It's not so much finding a secret strategy as uh, discovering a core character. And if we want to be people of influence and impact in this world, then there are particular qualities that need to mark our lives. Last week we thought about the attitudes that uh, have to be in our lives that are described in these opening Beatitudes and tonight we want particularly to think about the qualities that we're to bring to our relationships with the help of three of the latter Beatitudes. And the first of those Beatitudes under consideration is blessed are the merciful for those for they will be shown mercy. And this concerns particularly the quality of our relationship with those in Need. I wonder if you have a favourite flavour of ice cream. My particular favourite flavour is rum and raisin. Don't ask me why, I don't really know. But uh, there you have it. Sometimes you go into Mr. Boney's or some other ice cream parlour and there's such an array of them you don't know where to begin at all. And when uh, you say ice cream... Well, it can mean a thousand and one different things to people depending on the flavour they have in mind. Love has many flavours. And the love of God has many flavours. And one of the signs that we are possessed by the love of God is that the many flavours of God's love begin to express themselves in our lives. Grace and mercy are two of the flavours of God's love. They're words that we often use interchangeably. and We often link together. I think this helpful definition of the two helps to uh, distinguish the two. Grace deals with sin in providing pardon. Mercy deals with the results of sin pain, misery and distress in providing relief. The best example, best story is the story of the Good Samaritan. It is mercy that makes him cross the road. It is mercy that makes him get down and stem the flow of blood. It is mercy that makes him hoist the victim of another's violence on his shoulders and locate him a place of safety to rest in. It is mercy that causes him to dip into his pocket to provide for his welfare until he comes that way again. That is mercy. Grace would have been needed to deal with the mugger. Mercy finds the mugged and deals with the results of the violence. And that second part is very important. Many of us find victims of sin. Many of us see uh, the effects of sin in people's lives. We may even feel sorry for people as we see them in their sinfulness and in their sin againstness. But mercy is more than pity. It is more than feeling sorry. Mercy is pity in action. Blessed are the mercy fool. For my sins, I'm a fan of the proclaimers. So let me inflict a proclaimer song on you. I'm not going to sing it. Though I have been told I look like one of the twins. I think they've got more hair than me now. I certainly don't sound like them. My heart was broken. It's a bit repetitive, the Proclaimer song, because the second line is, My heart was broken. And then four times, sorrow, 
sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. My heart was broken. You saw it. You claimed it. You touched it. You saved it. My tears are drying. Thank you. That's the experience of one who's received mercy. The broken heart is claimed by another and owned by another and borne by another and bound up by another until it is mended and healed and made whole. It's Zechariah that sings so beautifully of the tender mercy of our God. He's seeing us in our mess comes forth not only to pardon the cause of that mess, our sin, but to deal with that mess in his mercy. And as we discovered last week and reflected last week on all of these Beatitudes, this again is one that is so foreign to the community, society, culture, world in which we live today. The world lacks mercy. We acknowledge by putting our hands up that we suffer compassion fatigue. We see the victims of this world's sin lying not only on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, but in the plains of Somalia, in the villages of Mozambique, in the high-rise blocks of the Red Road. I meet them struggling down Glen Manor Avenue five minutes late for school in the morning, hassled and weary trying to get their children to school. But we've grown tired and we cross the road. When mercy is lacking, the world finds the victim already leaning on the ropes and moves in to finish them off because there'll be one less mouth to feed. When mercy is lacking, the world switch offs, switches off the TV appeal, refuses to open the newspapers because it wants to insulate itself against the pain. When mercy is lacking, we live in a superficial world of fun and refuse to enter the deep ambiguities of a hurting world for fear of contamination. But the Christian, the follower of Jesus, the commissioned one of Jesus, sent to impact the world like salt and influence the world like light, is full of mercy. Sometimes on a Saturday we go up to the Karen Valley Reservoir for a walk and you'll know at the eastern end is it of the reservoir there are those large I don't know what you call them sluice gates or something hole somewhere in that wall and the water comes pouring out of the reservoir and falls away from it. but just occasionally when we've been up there there's no water coming out at all why? because somewhere there's no water going in there's been no rain or the rivers have stopped or the run off the hills has stopped and when there is no mercy being expressed in our lives it's a sign that we are empty of mercy that the mercy of God in Christ has been closed out Last week's preacher criticised Alec Ferguson. I'd like to associate with all his comments last week. But I'd like to point out another truth about Alec Ferguson this week. He was back in Govan. He's often back in Govan because he's never forgotten where he came from. That's an admirable quality in the man. Too easily we forget where we've come from. That when God found us, we were in a mess. That any cleanliness we possess today is because of him. That any righteousness we have is his. That we depend day by day on his mercy. I wonder if you know the story of Dr. Thomas Bernardo, the founder of Bernardo's home. 
became a Christian when he was 17 and entered medical school at 21 intending to go to China as a missionary but one evening walking home from university he had an experience that changed his life when he came across some destitute and homeless children in London's East End and so instead of going to China in 1870 he opened his first home for them in Stepney at the age of 25 In 40 years he raised over three million pounds and established the network of homes we know as Bardardos for the reception and care and training of homeless and needy and afflicted children. And in his lifetime, 60,000 children were welcomed into his homes. Among the street boys he first met was a young lad called John Summers, known as Carrots, something to do with the colour of his hair. He was 11 and he slept somewhere between Covent Garden and Billingsgate, an area that throngs with trendy shops now and tourists. One night Bernardo was out bringing in the homeless as was his way eh, and he came across carrots. He already had the five boys that he had room for in his home that night and though carrots pleaded for inclusion, he had to say to him there was no room, but he promised him Uh, that the first vacancy he would come and find him. The next morning a porter was moving a sugar container away from outside the home when he disturbed two sleeping boys. One of them, slippery as an eel it said, ran off into the morning sky. The other moved not. He was dead. It was carrot. And the coroner recorded the inquest into his death, death from exhaustion, the result of frequent exposure and lack of food. And that tragedy burned deep into Bernardo's soul. Never again, he said, never again. And he fixed the sign outside his Stepney home, no destitute child ever refused admission. And later he added, an ever open door. The one condition of eligibility for Bernardo's homes in those early days was destitution. Tell me, tell me that Thomas Bernardo has had no impact or influence in this world. Mercy makes a difference. The actively compassionate make a difference those whose hearts have an ever open door to those suffering from the mess of sin make a difference blessed are the merciful blessed are the peacemakers is our second beatitude tonight and this is to do and addresses our relationship with those in conflict it's important I think to say what it's not It's not a blessing upon appeasers. It's not a blessing upon those who avoid conflict at all costs. It is an encouragement to us to be peacemakers, to be those who make it their business to reconcile, to mend relationships, to make whole, not by ignoring differences or pretending that there's nothing there, but by dealing with them, by facing them in dealing with them. The Beatitude says, blessed the peacemakers are called children of God. They are owned by God as his children because they are doing their father's work. Did you know that peace is described as a characteristic of God in all but one of the New Testament books? And peacemaking is held up in numerous of the New Testament letters as a core to what Jesus' work on the cross was about. The opposite of peacemaking is troublemaking. Those who either by their self-assertiveness or their vindictiveness or their carelessness or their thoughtlessness sow seeds of division, discord and alienation. Now there are two sides to being a peacemaker. The one is that we are peaceable by nature. That we are not quarrelsome. 
And elsewhere in the New Testament we're commanded not to be quarrelsome. We don't pick fights easily. That, you might say, is the negative side of it, the passive side. The other active side is that we are pacific. We make it our business to make peace. We're not concerned to let sleeping dogs lie. We don't settle for the status quo unless it is anything other than wholesome. You and I are familiar with the peacemaking activities of a generation ago of uh, Henry Kissinger and the enormous energies he put into diplomatic, uh, shuttle diplomacy as they call it. But I wonder if you're aware of the peacemaking activities of the former President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. He was probably one of the most ridiculed presidents that America has ever had and he was at a very low ebb of popularity when he was thrown out after only four years in office. Jimmy Carter held it against no one and went back to his peanut farm from where he'd come. Went back to teaching his Bible class that he'd taught all his life and had tried to do on every Sunday even when he was president. And set about peacemaking. He wanted to use the contacts he'd made to address some of the issues that divide people in this world. He wanted to tackle some of the issues that cause conflict and alienation and he set up an institute of specialist peacemakers. But it wasn't all talk, talk, negotiate, negotiate. He wanted to deal with some of the causes and the root causes of alienation. So in partnership with others, Habits for Humanity, Habitats for Humanity, I think it's called, was formed. And so many weeks a year, Carter himself gets his hands dirty building houses for the poor in America, in Africa, and in Central America deals with some of the discontentment that lies at the root of conflict. Many of us have heard of his work. Many of us know what he's done with his life since he was president. How many headlines has he made? Few of us. Because peacemakers aren't concerned with themselves. They don't worry about how their reputation is going to be affected. That's not the issue and the agenda and their actions. It's the bringing together of that which is broken. It's the making whole of that which is fractured that concerns them. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, says Paul. But the history of God's people is a sorry one in this regard. If truth be told, we have been so unlike the Father that we've rendered him almost indescribable to many and totally incredulous to others. And I ask myself, I've asked myself this week as I've pondered this text, as my neighbours watch the video of my life, would they know that the script director in my life was the great peacemaker? Would they know that Christ's great gift to me was peace with God and peace from God? Would they understand that the one I serve came to make peace not with those that he liked but with those that he had been offended by. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called sons of God. Thirdly, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. This is to do with our relationship with those who are antagonistic towards us. Two things I think need to say, be said initially. The first is that there is a sequence to these beatitudes and the sequence is significant that persecution follows peacemaking. 
Don't think that if you strive after tonight to be a great peacemaker, you're going to be universally popular. Peacemaking involves dealing with offences. And people don't always want their offensiveness dealt with. And Jesus, the peacemaker, was persecuted by those he came to work amongst. And those who engage in his work are also. Notice too, please, that the blessing of God in this regard is upon those who are persecuted for righteousness. Not for being awkward, not for being obstinate, not for being self-righteous. There's no blessing on those who are persecuted for these reasons. Maybe this is an appropriate point to say something that was drawn to my attention this morning. Someone, when they went out of church this morning, had their car blocked in over here. Uh, an angry neighbour was distressed by uh, all these churchgoers that were parking in their parking spots and before they could move their car they had to go and knock this neighbour's door and I think receive a mouthful of abuse. Well, we won't be blessed because we're being awkward with our cars, you know, and people have a go at us. So we need to be considerate. The blessing lies on those who are living righteously, practicing righteous living, living rightly with God in Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I think, expands on this beatitude by drawing together insults and persecution and falsehoods spoken against people because of Jesus. All of these things belong to the same family because they come from the same source. And we are to respond to them in a particular way. What is that way? Well, it's neither retaliation nor withdrawal, but it's rejoicing. Not because we have a morbid sense of pleasure and pain, but we are to rejoice because it's one of the signs that we are Christ's, that we've become identified with Christ and that people are treating us as they treated him. And if we are identified with Christ, then we are on our way to somewhere and something that will bring us great joy. Some of you will have read this week in the the Christian literature of a, a Hindu Christian called Mokhtar Prasad. He was born in Tibet, a Hindu. He was the family priest to the family god. His wife suffered a miscarriage and subsequently he believed she was tormented by an evil spirit for ten years. He spent ten years sacrificing sheep and goats to placate his God and to plead for the removal of this evil spirit, all to no avail. And then someone visited his village from another place in Tibet who was a Christian and told him of the power of Jesus to deliver people and invited him and his wife to visit them for prayer and they did and his wife was delivered of this evil spirit that's ten years ago this year he became a devoted follower of Jesus and began to evangelize in his own village where there had never been a Christian witness By 1995, there were 200 believers in that mountain mountain village. The Maoists came to them on Christmas Day when they gathered for uh, Christmas Day worship, removed their Bible, banned its use, and threatened their lives if they were found meeting together in this way again. They continued to meet in secret house meetings for some weeks, until Mokhtar Prasad was told by other believers in the village that the Maoists were after him and his life was in danger and they wanted him to leave for the sake of his family. It was winter time and he had to drudge through six feet of snow for two days simply to get to the next valley 
and another 12 days to get to the next village. Since then, he's been working among the Loba people, further in Tibet. For seven years he's been working there. Not one believer has emerged. Not one person has been converted. And yet just recently the local authorities there asked him to leave because he came from a Maoist area and they didn't trust him. And so for the second time in his life he's on the move hunted and persecuted what does he say at the end of his story we count it all joy to to be considered worthy to suffer for Christ Jesus I don't know how you react to these kind of stories they are not unusual There are many in our world counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And they put us to shame when we decide to withdraw from the relationship with the neighbour who criticises us or eat our lunch in another place in the office because of the abuse we suffer. For we bear suffering very lightly cope with it very badly blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness there's a quality and a character that we're to bring to that relationship when we're persecuted that will make an impact and an influence and it's not withdrawal and it's not retaliation it's taking it to the Lord and rejoicing and being counted worthy and being numbered with God I want to suggest three things for us to do at the end of this evening to consider these beatitudes and their call to our relationships and that is to examine our relationships in three dimensions the first is to examine our relationship with God several commentators I think helpfully point out the connections within this sermon of Jesus and particularly within these Beatitudes. The first few are to do with our emptiness and our consciousness of need. They're to do with being poor in spirit and mourning over our sinfulness, with being meek because we realize we have nothing to boast of. And as we become aware of our emptiness, we hunger and thirst for God to fill us. And God does fill us. He fills us so that we're full of mercy. And our hearts are pure and we're peacemakers. So there is a sense, a very real sense, that we will know nothing of the blessing of the second part of the sermon unless we've passed through and lingered and stopped in the first part of the sermon. So if we find our relationships as we reflect on them in recent days, if we find our relationships in this world have counted for nothing, that we've had little impact and no influence, that in truth we're bringing nothing to them, then maybe it's this relationship, this core relationship with God that we need to examine first of all. Secondly, We need to examine our relationship with each other. In a few minutes we'll draw our service to a conclusion. Who will you seek out to talk to at that point? The like-minded? Your best friend? Or are our hearts drawn to those evidently weighed down and weary? those who we can see in the very lines on their faces who are bruised and hurting and broken? Or what of those who have offended us? Is there any relationship with a brother or a sister here tonight that is not 
whole that's in a state of disrepair that is not at peace we have an astonishing ability to coexist sometimes and to put up with obstacles between us without any attempt to tear down the obstacles and rebuild the friendship I'm always struck by the fact that the apostle uses the same word of my relationship with God as my relationship with my brothers and sisters that it was peace he came to bring in both so I ask myself tonight and I ask you to consider this question also if my relationship with Jesus was in the same state as my relationship with X, Y, or Z, would he be satisfied? Is that the peace he came to bring between you and him and between us? So we want to examine our relationships with each other to know and to see if they're filled with mercy if they're characterized by peacemaking and if they're not we want to go back to the beginning of the sermon again and recognize the bankruptcy spiritual bankruptcy and pray for God to fill us. Thirdly and lastly, we want to examine our relationships with the wider world. What is it that I bring to those relationships? I can only bring something if I am something. Before I can do anything, I need to be something. Maybe that's why these uh, words are called the be attitudes. There's a story in John Stott's biography that Timothy Dudley Smith wrote that those of us who read it were quite moved by it's a story that one of his study assistants I think it was Mark Lamberton tells of a visit that the two of them paid to Calcutta John Stott was there to preach but they took time to visit the Sisters of Mercy and spend some time in their work in the streets and when they were leaving Calcutta and its smells and its noise and its destitution after a few weeks, Mark Lamberton turned to John Stott and said, Could you live here permanently? Stott said to him, <laughs> with his Cambridge English, One would count it an honour if one was called to, wouldn't one? Mark Lamberton said, One might want to count it an honour, but I'm not sure one would, at least not if that one were me. To which Stott replied, But doesn't meeting the Sisters of Mercy and seeing their work make you just want to join them? And Lamberton said in all the years he worked with John Stott, he never heard a more sincerely spoken sentence than that sentence. Those who are filled with mercy, when they see me, want to meet it. I want to finish with, I suppose, a semi-amusing story that happened to us this week. Uh, some time ago when people moved into the street, not our immediate neighbours, another family in the street, and we were eager to make contact with them and we to welcome them and to... Uh, establish a relationship with them for neighbour's sake and for the gospel's sake we made what we thought were several attempts at kindness towards them and welcoming flowers and God had a little gift and they were largely rebuffed and they've shown no interest in a relationship with us at all and they have a cat which has taken a liking to our garden 
and has decided that uh, it wants to make it its territory, as they say. And it's been a little frustrating. And I suppose we've started to think of our neighbours in terms of their cat recently and become a little frustrated by them. And just over the last two or three weeks we've been putting out, you know how you do big Coke bottles full of water, just throw them around the garden and somehow it keeps cats from doing their thing in the garden. And it was proving successful. And I think it was on Wednesday that the neighbour came to the door for the first time and said, eh, we're going on holiday on Monday and we wondered if you'd look after our cat. Well, my struggle with man's dogs is very public. Never mind with neighbour's cats. Margaret's reflection was that God had a very strange sense of humour. But I was glad. Because we'd laid out all these little symbols and signs that said, keep away. And somehow, by the grace of God, they've seen something else. They're out of all the families in the street. We're not their immediate neighbours. They've seen something in us that makes us trustworthy to give a key to and give their alarm to. But no one else in the street has ever asked me to look after their cat. And I wonder if all they've seen in me is the bottles that say, keep away. I'm not interested in your mess. Keep it out of my private place. But I know, I know from tonight, I know from working on this, that if my life is to have an impact and an influence in the street, then it's mercy they need to see in me. And it's peacemaking they need to see in me. And it's a right response to their sniggers and laughter when I say I'm a minister of the gospel. And your neighbours need to see that in you as well, in you what needs. I want to use a little prayer for us to finish with tonight. It's a prayer about repentance. It's in the language of turning, but the writer means, when he uses the word turning, repentance. It's a Jewish prayer. You may find it helpful to make your own as you consider the qualities of your relationships tonight and the need to fill them and be filled with something new. Now is the time for turning. The leaves are beginning to turn from green to red to orange. The birds are beginning to turn and head once more towards the south. The animals are beginning to turn to store their food for the winter. The leaves and birds and animals turning comes instinctively. But for us, turning does not come easily. It takes an act of the will for us to make us turn. It takes the grace of God to make us turn. It means breaking a lifetime habit. It means admitting that we've been wrong and that is never easy. It means losing face. It means beginning again and that is always painful. It means saying I'm sorry. It means recognizing the possibility of change by God's grace. All of these things are terribly hard to do, to do, but unless we turn, we will be trapped forever in yesterday's failures and breakdowns and ways. So Lord, help us. Help us to turn from callousness to sensitivity, from hostility to love, from pettiness to purpose, from envy to contentment, from carelessness to discipline, from fear to faith, 
Turn us round, O Lord, and begin by turning us back to you. Revive us as at the beginning. And turn us again towards each other, Lord. For in isolation, there is no life, but only death. Our closing hymn is number 463. 463. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day by his love and power controlling all I do.